Hey, Rachel. Hey, Brian. So how was your week? It was interesting. This week brought some good, long-anticipated news. The FDA finally approved the Pfizer vaccine, mm. and surely this will be the thing to convince these anti-vaxxers, these holdouts, to finally get the shot, right? Yeah, right, because they uh, they say they've been waiting for this because they have so much trust in government institutions like the CDC that they were really waiting for the FDA. They're to waiting for classic. the imprimatur <laughs> from another government agency. But anyway, if that's not enough... Um, um, the catchy brand will certainly get their attention because going forward, the Pfizer shot is going to be called Comirnaty from the makers of Celebrex comes <laughs> Comirnaty. Like merely community? Or... Like, I guess maybe, or or comorbidity. <laughs> that's like. more like it. That's more like, like it. And, and that's a nope. And we're going to have a lot more nope. because this is nope. <laughs> the podcast where we shut it down. We're just a couple of New York Jews talking about the news, beating back the blues. We made a podcast and here's why. To laugh so we don't cry. Come and join us for the ride. Welcome to Okay, welcome back, Rachel. We have uh, an amazing guest. First guest in a little while, right? Yes, we've got Josh Rofe, who has a new documentary about the iconic painter Bob Ross. I don't know if you all remember him, but he was he had a show on um, PBS, PBS in yeah. the night. In the 1980s, called The Joy of Painting, where he would paint these gorgeous landscapes in just 30 minutes. And he's still, you know, he's become a big meme. He's got that big puffy hair. People, people love him. Gen Xers love him. So this documentary just dropped on Netflix and uh, Josh will be interviewed at the end of the show. So stick around for that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, usually, Rachel, at the beginning of the show, we each kind of trade personal stories for this week. But this week's story is so epic that it's uh, it's it both of our both of us. <laughs> we both got sucked <laughs> into the vortex, such as it is. Yes. So, but I'll let you tell it because I I am not so good at the mastery of the details. Okay, so um, we have a show email account which I have on my Twitter. It's this week in nope at gmail dot com, and we get all kinds of emails from people at this account, and we love that. But this one was different. We got one this week, or last week, and it took my breath away. Um, here's what it said verbatim. Hey, yes, Kristen farted. No, hey, Jess. Yes, Kristen farted in the middle of the all hands meeting. I was there. I thought it was a trumpet. It was awkward. <laughs> She had just begun the presentation to the management team, and then that happened. She dealt with the situation gracefully. She said, excuse me, well, let's hope that's the only hiccup. Everyone laughed, and the rest of her presentation was superb. Even even Catherine thought so. Oh. so <laughs> Who's this Catherine? <laughs> Who's Catherine? Why is she so hard to please? So I get this email. I had so many questions. I forwarded it to you. And the first question was really, is this intended for us? <laughs> right? Because we do get... I didn't think so. <laughs> that might have been like a story idea for us. Like... <laughs> I mean, I, I figured maybe not because neither of us is named Jess, but you never know. So, you know, so many questions. Who is Catherine? So many characters. There's Jess, there's Kristen, there's Catherine, there's the guy who wrote the email named Jim. It was like a whole Robert Altman It's like the cast of The movie. Office. Right? Yes. <laughs> so I decided to write back to the person who wrote it. And um, his name was Jim. And Jim wrote back immediately and was like, oops, sorry, the email was intended for someone else. But that did not satisfy my wait, curiosity. Wait, no, 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 wait. Does that mean that he started <laughs> typing in like this week in Nope and it auto popular like someone whose name is someone like someone named Jess? Like <laughs> this week in Hope. This week in <laughs> Jess? I mean, I, it didn't make any sense. So, because whose email is like this week in Nope? So, I, I really needed to get to the bottom of this mystery because if we can't figure out this, what where can we are figure we? Out? <laughs> where are we in life, right? Forget <laughs> like nowhere. the origins of COVID. That's easy compared to this. Like, well, you know, this, I just figured this would be a good thing to tackle to make myself feel a little bit better. So I asked Jim, 
if perhaps he was a listener of this podcast and he confirmed that he in fact was, and he said that he had even previously reached out to us to express his enthusiasm for the podcast, which is great. So our email address, as we mentioned, it auto-populated when he's trying to reach his coworker, Jess, whose email address for some reason also starts with a TH as in this week in Nope. So he was writing to Jess and it populated. Okay, fine. But then there were more questions like, was this meeting indoors? Was it over <laughs> Zoom? How many people were there? Were they wearing masks? What was this presentation about? If Catherine thought it was so superb, maybe we could learn something from it. This and, is the and- uh, this is the investigative journalist in you. I see. I would have never thought. To, I would have let the matter rest, <laughs> and yet you. No, I couldn't. There are more I hiccups coming. Yes. <laughs> so I fire away with this barrage of questions, and Jim then loops in Kristen. The woman who farted <laughs> in the meeting <laughs> and Kristen was such a good sport she explained everything she said she works for an advertising company in Texas I'm not going to say exactly where she's located or even give her last name because I want to protect her identity the innocent. <laughs> she's, she's, she's in witness protection <laughs> So she said there were like 40 people, including the CEO, packed into this tiny conference room in Texas in the middle of a fucking pandemic, which is such a nope. And Kristen said she was not happy about this, but she was vaccinated in April. And most of the people who were in the meeting were also vaccinated, but not everybody. And hardly anyone was wearing a mask. But despite these concerns, Kristen kept going. And then she delivers this superb presentation about strategies that her advertising agency can use to expand into new markets in the fiscal year that begins on October 1st. But if and anything it, is ever going to make you fart, it's talking it's about that. strategy for expanding into new markets. I know every time anyone mentions that, it's like it just, it, the gas Your erupts. stomach just starts... <laughs> But <laughs> but so, I don't know, the, the presentation was fabulous. Even Catherine liked it. So I say nope to the management for forcing this crowded in-person meeting. And yup to Kristen for farting. It was the only reasonable response because <laughs> she, she had wanted to clear to- <laughs> She had to clear the room. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Her body was reacting. It was having like a visceral reaction to the crowd. So I'm glad we cleared that all up. And thank you, Kristen. And uh, thank Thanks for the email and please continue to send us <laughs> Jim, random. Jim, if anything else happens, <laughs> please let us know. And thanks to both of you for being good sports. And Catherine, if you want to be a guest, like we love, you sound like a fascinating, tough, but you sound tough, but fair, which is the best you could say about a boss. So. Yes. <laughs> Oh, and and we've been thinking about advertising the podcast, so maybe you'd be a good agency. You could maybe. expand it to a new market. Yes, <laughs> you could help us expand to new markets. That would be great. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's move on to the notes. Rachel, you have a dry heave, don't you? I yes, I have the dry heave to end all dry heaves. So. It's about Matt Gates. We, uh, you know, periodically update people on what's going on with Matt Gates, and I'm sad to say that he is still in Congress, even though he's under investigation for child sex trafficking. But um, he's not worried about that. He's been touring around the country with his fellow congressional garbage monster Marjorie Taylor Greene, holding rallies in MAGA country where they denounce vaccines and declare that Donald Trump won the election. So you know, just the normal undermining public health and government type of bullshit. And then this week we witnessed the final indignity. Matt Gates got married. Oh <laughs> he, no. So he's off yes. the market. This he's, is a tragedy is, for women is, everywhere. He's, he's taken. He's taken. But again, like who you know, would like, marry that piece of garbage? Who would marry she looks this like person? a rabid Muppet. Like he's disgusting. He is with that hair, with that face. I mean, with like what a this pun investigation. Of, what a pun on that one. Yeah. Who wants to marry this person at this particular moment in time? And so, I mean, I guess the moral of the story is that there's a lid for every pot. There's someone for everyone. <laughs> but <is> <laughs> yes. <laughs> But this woman, when you're ha- when you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Look a nail. Yes. <laughs> Something. 
but this woman, Ginger Lucky, is very confusing to me. So she's 26 years old. She has a good job at a promising startup. And she's the sister of Palmer Lucky, who's the guy that created the Oculus Rift VR technology for Facebook. Mm. So it's not like she's like broke or desperate. And she met Matt Gates in March 2020 when her mother brought her along to the most romantic location on earth, which is Kimberly Guilfoyle's 50th oh. birthday party at Mar-a-Lago. Oh. <laughs> so according to a Vanity Fair profile, Ginger Lucky was wearing this like sexy backless dress and Matt Gates was the only man there who didn't inappropriately touch her back. Oh, so well, was... that's... Wait, that's a negative in Mar-a-Lago. Like if you're well, back... Well, she was kind of like, he didn't sexually assault me. I'm going to marry him. <laughs> that's, yes. called, that's called playing hard to get yes exactly so ginger was seated with him at his table and it was filled with all these trumpy luminaries but in a weird twist she had no idea who anybody was including don jr and eric she asked eric trunk to take a photo of her and matt gates thinking he was just a random guest she asked tucker carlson what show he had on television (laughs) and when she saw don jr she asked matt gates who is this man dressed like he's on duck dynasty so basically (laughs) this explains everything ginger lucky is a woman with a lobotomy straight out of the stepford wives she doesn't know what's going on or who anybody is she's been living in a cave she's the perfect woman my real Matt question Gates. is what was don jr wearing that he looked like he was in duck dynasty i know Cam- was he camouflage? wearing like a hunting camouflage? A hunting and also, how do you not recognize eric trump i was sitting behind eric trump on a plane and i recognized like the you tip of the his back hair. of his hair yes. i know i know it's uh, but you're like a i guess you're a news lover so maybe you just knew you know about current events i don't i don't know i don't know how she didn't know who that was but so so they get engaged 10 months after meeting and they plan to get married next summer but i guess they just couldn't wait to tie the knot because who knows matt gates could be in prison any day so they had a small ceremony on catalina island just 22 miles off the coast of southern california last weekend and you may wonder brian who was there i do wonder i do wonder that's as soon (laughs) as you started talking (laughs) i started wondering (laughs) so a few dozen people attended including a man named sergio gore who is a former Rand paul staffer who was both the officiant and also the dj um (laughs) Palmer Save Lucky money that was way. there. <laughs> yes, Palmer Lucky was there, and but not uh, Ginger Lucky's sister, who has been TikToking about this relationship, and which negatively being very critical negatively. Oh, yeah, Roxanne. Okay lucky she's the real hero of the family and the hosts of steve bannon's war room raheem kassam and natalie winters were there that's the show that was pulled from youtube after steve bannon said that he wanted to put anthony fauci's head on a pike Hmm. nice people um so also in attendance was nestor um matt gates's possibly but probably not adopted son (laughs) right what was the what was the story there there's something lewd about that relation that it's father-son something very strange yes. he's like the he's like the cuban younger brother of a woman he used to date right. and it's right. it's all it's all very weird um and you know you wonder who catered this affair i do who, wonder like, who catered this yeah. affair rachel <laughs> matt gates <laughs> he cooked himself <laughs> he cooked for the entire wedding what did he do get like pigs and blankets from trader joe's and stick it in the oven Probably the menu was barbecue chicken legs, grilled vegetables, and a watermelon salad. Wait, that, that, that like wait, the, that's like twenty dollars per plate. It's not. It's like seven dollars per that's plate. That's nothing. I mean, like including this the paper plates, like that. And listen, I like barbecue chicken legs, whatever. But like, have some variety. Like, what watermelon? Yeah, salad? at least it's give us like chicken wedding. or beef or a vegetarian option, right? Like, <laughs> like. Something have like a, like some I don't know you know how they have those little stations yeah have a like carb, carving duck, duck a peking duck, <laughs> peking duck a nice a Wuhan duck <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know I recently watched the documentary um, Woodstock ninety nine mm, on yeah. I think it's on HBO Max and as I watched a uh, mosh pit go crazy as the band Corn played I told Josh like this is hell but actually this wedding. <laughs> 
as hell. Sounds even worse. This is hell. So congratulations. Welcome to hell, <laughs> Ginger Lucky. <laughs> and no, and no. And no, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Um, we have another. Oh, this is a good one, Rachel. One was there's a great Vanity Fair headline that caught my eye, and I had to figure out what it was about. The headline was Rock Bottom, colon. <laughs> Rudy Giuliani is one week away from waxing his back in the middle of a sweet green. Um, and that would be better than what he did. That would did. be better than what happened. So, of course, that was that was. That was legitimate clickbait that I appreciated them having because it got me into a great story, which is that Rudy Giuliani, among all of his other antics with the uh, with uh, the the hair dye melting and his farting and <laughs> dialing the wrong person and the Four Seasons Landscaping Company, he also was spotted <laughs> shaving in uh, I think it was in JFK at an airport restaurant shaving his beard <laughs> at an airport <laughs> restaurant. Uh, can you think of something more disgusting? Did the shavings, did the stubble go into his food? What kind of, I have so many questions. What kind of restaurant? Which gate? What terminal? Like, is there a rule? Like, isn't there a TSA rule against that? You're not, you can't bring a blade like that through, how did he get it through security? Was like, it an electric razor? Was it, where did he plug it in? Because it needs that special plug, right? Yeah, yeah. This, so anyway, that's the whole story. It's disgusting. That's the story. That's it's... the whole story. And then I have another quick hit about the dry heaves. These don't warrant a whole segment where I discovered, uh, so on CNN, they were covering that Trump rally where he said, like, very snarky way, he's like, oh, so you wondering whether to get vaccinated? I got vaccinated, so get back. I know you love your freedoms. He does his whole borscht belt shtick, right? He's like, yeah, I know you love your freedoms, but uh, I got vaccinated. What do you want to say? And he gets booed. So it was like a very half-hearted endorsement. And afterwards, they were interviewing these yokels in the parking lot who said that they weren't getting vaccinated, no way, no how, because it wasn't approved by the FDA. Well, We'll see what happens now. Um, and the interviewer said, OK, so you don't believe the CDC. You don't believe Dr. Fauci. You don't believe every scientist in America. Who do you believe? And she says, I believe Dr. Tenpenny. And <laughs> I thought you were going to say Donald Trump, and I was like, well, then get vaccinated. No, no. she said, I <laughs> Who only is believe Dr. Tenpenny. <laughs> Dr. Tenpenny is one of what I learned is the dirty dozen that uh, <laughs> Biden was talking about, that these are the 12 uh, people who spread the most in misinformation about the vaccine. And I think Dr. Tenpenny is number one. And her big belief, and she testified before Congress about this, I don't know who would put her on the stand, sworn testimony that if you take the vaccine, it makes you magnetic. And she says, you see people all around, people who are vaccinated with, and she makes it with spoons hanging from their body. Now, this explains so much. <laughs> all those people walking around New York City. <laughs> With spoons hanging from their body. Um, so that's the story, I guess. <laughs> Dr. Tenpenny. Sounds like a nope, Bond nope, vi villain, nope right? To Dr. Tenpenny. <laughs> Tenpenny. Who okay. Who okay. this shit? Those are, the, okay. those, are, those are my dry heaves. That's all I got. Rachel, this one's for you. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on. Um, so when I first heard about the new host of Jeopardy being named, uh, I was like Jeopardy is still going on. And then when I heard his name was Mike Richards, I was like, oh, that's a really unusual choice because I thought people were talking about the actor who played Kramer on Seinfeld. Yeah, Michael Richards, yeah. The, whose the name one was who's also like Michael Richards. Canceled for racist jokes. And yeah, and yeah. I was like, didn't he have some racist thing? And then rant. It was a rant. everyone yeah. was going berserk on Twitter about it. So I was like, oh, I guess it was <laughs> Michael Richards from Seinfeld. But no, it was a different <laughs> Michael Richards but the same exact sort of <laughs> racist controversy because it is a garbage world and we are just I saw this happen but I did not dig deep enough to figure out what he actually said so exactly. I assume you did your research and actually found out what he said no what you're saying is it resonates because it was just kind of playing out in the background I was like who the fuck cares about this and and I wasn't paying any attention at all and I didn't even know Jeopardy was still on. No, but he was going to alternate. Trebek. He's alternating with Maya Bialik. Yes. So, yes. But break. now she's taking over as yes. like a guest. She's breaking the glass ceiling. She's the she first is. female host Blossom. of Jeopardy. 
she's the only host. Well, she, there was a host for Alice Trebek, but uh, maybe Six. Do you remember on Blossom, her best friend was named Six. Oh, Maybe six would be a good host. Six, we her and six. Propose her. <laughs> so, yeah. So was Alex Trebek, the longtime host, I think he was the host for like 36 years or something. He died in November, tragically. And then I learned that, you know, this this search is underway to replace him. So there's all these names being floated. LeVar Burton, the reading well, they did audi- guy. They did auditions. They, like, let them go for a few weeks to see. It was like Regis and Kathy Lee. Like, they had guest hosts for a while. Right. And they Mayim Bialik did it. You know, um, the champion, the Jeopardy champion, Ken Jennings. And then, like, there's this random guy, Mike Richards, who is a longtime game show producer. He used to be the executive producer of The Price is Right. And now he happens to be Jeopardy. Jeopardy's executive producer. So when it was announced that he would be taking over, it was like basically like he did this search and then was like, no, it's going to be me. <laughs> well, that's, how, that's how Dick Cheney became vice president. Remember when exactly. W was elected? He was, uh, Dick Cheney was the head of the search committee and he's like, nope, he's I got like, no one. I guess I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike Richards is the Dick Cheney of, of game shows. So, <laughs> so he goes to film a bunch of episodes on his first day of work. And by the end of his first day, he's, he's resigned. <laughs> What happened? Podcasts. That's what. Oh. Um, so there was a report in the ringer by a journalist named Claire McNear, who had written a book about Jeopardy. And she revealed a series of offensive comments that Mike Richards made on a podcast he once ran called The Random Show. Random, R-A-N-D-U-M-B, um, in case you want to <laughs> look it up. <laughs> but like these are these podcasts are just like out in the open for anyone to listen to. So the fact that there was no due diligence, this was only in 2013. So she listens to these episodes. And in one of the episodes, he joked about women who dress like hookers on Halloween. He called his female co-host a booth slut because she once worked at a consumer show in Las Vegas. <laughs> He described women who wear one-piece swimsuits as looking frumpy and overweight. He referred to stereotypes about Jews and large noses and Asians. And, you know, he was just like an equal opportunity asshole. asshole. So um, this is after Sony already knew about a series of lawsuits over accusations of sexist behavior at his last job overseeing The Price is Right. One of the show's on-air models announced that she was pregnant with twins and he was a total dick about that. So what do we learn from this? Like, what? Like, how <laughs> no, is this don't stuff? hire a radio asshole. <laughs> but how is this? Uh, they need, I a more, they need due diligence. They need a more rigorous vetting process. And he should have been um, conflicted, at, conflicted out. Like he yes. had a conflict of interest there. You can't pick yourself to be the host of Jeopardy. And also, Alex Trebek is a beloved American institution, right? He's a char- you know yeah. charming and knowledgeable and and gracious. He's like Bob to everybody. Ross. He's like you know? Bob Ross, but with similarly curly hair, I think. Right? <laughs> um, he was the Bob Ross of the ages. Um, yeah, and uh, you should be selective. They did this whole audition process, and like Ken Jennings wasn't good enough, but this garbage monster was. No. Was- no. no, no, absolutely not. No, no, this is a disaster. Who are they going to get now? I mean, I Mayim just let Maya. What? Why, why can't Maya do it? Just right. let, let her go. Let her go. Isn't she like an astrophysicist or something? No, she's a or neuroscientist, like a... and she does now does like some pharma commercial where she's like, "Yes, on Big Bang Theory, I play." Is that what she was on? I don't even know. Yeah. I played a scientist, but I'm actually a real neuroscientist. Oh, it's one of those drugs that improves your memory, but probably doesn't. And I was okay. surprised she did it, but it's probably pays well. So, um, so nope to Jeopardy. I don't watch you anyway, but I'm certainly not going to start now. Although if my Bialik is a full-time host, maybe when I'm flipping around, I might stop and uh, take a gander. I bet she'd be good. Yeah. What is nope? (laughs) Survey survey says nope. Nope. (laughs) Okay. uh, I'm going to wrap with this. So we used to do, we have done over the years, a lot of food stories, restaurant stories, I'm going to tell you the story of a San Francisco restaurant called Lily. 
and its chef named Rob Lamb. It's this amazing upscale Vietnamese restaurant in the Richmond district. I'm sure you've been in that neighborhood. Um, we had a great live show in San Francisco. Um, look yes. forward to uh, post COVID when we might be able to do that again. But you know, it's been hard times for restaurants and they're, they're coming to all sorts of, you know, schemes and gimmicks and discounts to drum up business. Um, so uh, Rob Lamb decided he was gonna do the opposite of a discount. He was gonna go really highbrow. And he said the premise was, let's do something over the top and bougie. And the answer was he added to the menu $72, $72 fried rice. And mm -hmm. fried rice is like the lowest food cost of any food on the planet. It like costs, even if you pay whatever ten dollars for a thing of fried rice it costs like 30 it's high cents margin to make. it's very yeah. high margin food right mm -hmm. so 72 dollar fried rice what could possibly go wrong let me tell you what's in this fried rice it's premium red king crab from japan echo certified sturgeon caviar steak from olive fed cattle i didn't know that cattle fed upon olives but <laughs> Maybe okay. it makes for a tastier cut of beef. Um, a variety of crab pieces and parts to create a stock, which they reduce to its essence and use to create a highly concentrated crab butter. And this uh, this dish is technically in Vietnamese called Doc Biet fried rice. But um, of course, people started calling it douchebag fried rice. Um, mm -hmm. And the people calling it that were the chefs and the cooks who actually grew to hate this dish. So this poor fried rice was the victim of its own success. They started getting 20 orders a night and it took it so much. It sounds delicious. It does Not sound delicious. Whatever, but it's, and there's uni in it too, right? <laughs> yeah, there's uni in it too. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but also caviar, like do you want caviar and fried? Like the whole point of caviar is like it stands on its blini and you get to like. I'll have it on the, anything. <laughs> you're not going to mix it in, like cook it into fried rice. Like, I think it uh, sounds amazing. <laughs> On the crab. Actually, my favorite Great. thing about the story is that it was in the in the New York Post, and it, they tried to say it was wok seared fried rice, and it was a typo, and it said it's woke seared fried rice. Oh, so <laughs> it made me think: what what would woke fried rice be? I don't know. Um, so anyway, the the chefs and the cooks mutinied. They protested, saying it was so much work that it wasn't worth it. Their hands were getting cut, like opening up the crabs. And for the owner, it, they, it caused an identity crisis. He said, this just wasn't us. It wasn't who we wanted to be. In our essence, you know, you, your, your, your food has to speak to who you are, and this just wasn't him. So then he wrote this extensive Instagram post, like long, and he said, We are sad slash glad to announce the departure of our crab fried rice. This will be the last week to try, ending Friday. And then he tried to pedal it back with an explanation, but I'm not buying it. He said, We did this as a joke, a stoned out, bored ass pandemic gift <clears throat> to soothe and take, to, to soothe to soothe a takeout nation during the holidays. It was a two-week special. We never meant for this to take off. This dish isn't even Vietnamese. So now they're dissing their own food, but he left the door open. Um, he said, perhaps the fried rice might come back during Dungeness season. Perhaps we do it on a secret menu. Whatever the case, say goodbye to my little friend. Emoji crab, emoji rice. Um, mm. So I mean... It's kind of like his moral compass and his business were going in two opposite directions. <laughs> they were directions. spinning a rise, like the magnetic north and the true north. It's or... like the vaccine <laughs> with the spoons <laughs> and the magnets. Maybe that's the his, problem. Maybe he's vaccinated and there were the chefs. His moral compass <laughs> was going crazy. <laughs> We so, it out. so, so I'm sorry, I don't I don't know if this was a stunt or not a stunt or whatever, but you know, I think in this post COVID world, like this is not the kind of fun we need. And if it does, do like a fun, affordable. This is not the way to like you know soothe a takeout nation is by having something that oh. nobody can afford and to rip off people who splurge on it. That's a terrible and thing also, to do. Like, why are you like trying that stunt in San Francisco where like douchebags, rich douchebags live? Like, of course that's going to appeal to your. It's like market. a magnet. No offense it's like, to listeners in San Francisco, but there, I mean, there happen to be a lot of uh, it indexes with high more on money than taste. You know. Yes. <laughs> well, clearly, and the fact that they were selling twenty of them a night. Um, I think if they think if it's on the menu and it's expensive it must be good and you should have just done an offshoot restaurant where they only made that yes a pop-up or a food truck a 
yeah i mean what keep is the, it's just keep the money flowing keep it, <laughs> go go where the market is <laughs> supply and demand okay so nope to the douchebag fried rice um okay uh should we uh cut over inter- so we did this interview like 15 minutes ago for reasons that are particular to podcast scheduling and guest scheduling but rachel i'll let you uh introduce uh introduce the segment as if it were happening in real time now we have our special guest, Josh Rofe, director of Bob Ross, Happy Accidents, Betrayal and Greed. It's just out now on Netflix. Watch it. It's fascinating. Um, and also, Josh, you directed Sasquatch, which Brian well, loves so I, much. I, I love Sasquatch. <laughs> I watch it because I did, unlike Rachel, I did not get a screener due to an unfortunate incident with the Academy a few years back. So I'm on the screener blacklist for everybody. But I love Sasquatch. What did you do, Brian? What happened? <laughs> uh, you made You're, 18 copies and gave them away. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I was. Uh, I signed a non-disclosure <laughs> agreement. Um, but uh, I can't wait to watch it. And uh, I was hoping that Bob Ross would be like Sasquatch, but I suspect maybe it's a little different. And uh, I'll let Rachel <laughs> pick up and discuss it with you. Yeah. So, Josh, welcome to Nope. Um, and I guess could you tell us a little bit about the movie? Um, I would say the film is. It's part biopic. It's it's part expose. Um, it's a father son story. Um, it's a story about the murkiness that could surround uh, an artist's rights and, and and who they're left to once that person passes away. And I think really what it does is it it explores the the greatest moments in Bob Ross's life and also the darkest. Um, I. Sometimes other people are better at uh, at describing the things that, that, than you are, but uh, uh, but I think that I think that's a pretty decent encapsulation. Yeah, he's such a an iconic character. I mean, my son even is obsessed with watching Bob Ross, and I used to watch him when I was a kid. I mean, were, uh, Josh, given how iconic he is, were you at all worried? And and you know, I don't know. It sounds like there's two sides to this story, and it's nuanced, like any other good documentary. Like, sort of like telling your kid that there's no Santa Claus, that this revered figure might there might be more to the story than uh, than they than they are led to the believe. Eye. Yes. <laughs> So when I when I was making this, friends would ask me, "Well, what are you up to?" And uh, I'd say, "I'm I'm making a doc about Bob Ross." And they would look at me like they were like they were pissed at me because they know everything I make is dark. And they're, they're like, "Don't you don't you ruin him?" I, 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 I up Bob Ross. And I, I said, I, I, I and I, I understood that. And I said, "Listen, I actually I, I promise you, you're going to love him more after you see this doc, and 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 it's it's going to break your heart." And I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I walked away from this with a deeper connection to, to Bob than I could have ever imagined. And I, my hope is that when people watch this, they'll, they'll feel the same way. Yeah. I I mean, I don't want to reveal any spoilers, but, um, one of the smaller revelations that I found to be shocking is that, um, Bob Ross's hair, his iconic, um, fro is a perm. And I have so many questions about this, but I guess like, <laughs> we cut to the deep think... <laughs> issues here on this podcast. <laughs> what do you think that, and he would say he's like tightening the screws or something when he's getting a, when he's, when he was getting a perm, right? Yeah. I mean, th- there's, <laughs> we we literally we could have done 10 minutes just on the hair but you you would have been mad at me by minute two and said <laughs> enough already um but yeah it you know the, the hair was a perm um and there's there's multiple stories there's there's uh there's the version that says that they had his face printed on the paints and and the the different uh the different items that they were going to use to promote the show back in the day. And so he couldn't cut his hair anymore because that's what he looks like on, on, on the, on the oh. promo materials. And then, and then there's the, the other one is that he, he, he needed to save money. Um, and so instead of going for haircuts, he would just, he would just keep it long and, and, and throw it up in a perm. But uh, yeah, it is, that is not his natural hair, which I, mean, I think yeah, actually I think- makes it way more impressive. It is, because I think he knew something that people don't often realize, which is that you have to, like, have a signature look if you're on TV and keep it the same. And he had this consistency and this very unusual style that I think um, he was a fashion icon before before his time, you know? I mean, Bob was a performer um, Mm -hmm. and and he really he was a skilled performer and he 
while while he was truly genuine, um, he also he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew how to connect with an audience, and I think that came from having really years of experience of sort of being a hotshot painter in his little circles long before he had the show. When Bob Ross was the guy who, you know, 20 years before he had the show, he would be in a painting class. And at some point during the class, everybody would put their paintbrush down and sort of make their way over to his easel to watch what he was doing. I mean, he, he really, um, he, he was talented and he, he was magnetic, uh, you know, in, in some ways from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, every time I see him paint, I'm like, wow, this guy is so talented. Yet at the same time, his work is so associated with bad taste. And why do you think that is? And do you think there'll be some kind of artistic reassessment of his work going forward? Yeah, I I think Bob's work is beautiful and, and, and comforting and cozy, and it makes me feel good when I look at it. Um, if if somebody doesn't like it, that's that's their prerogative. Not everybody has to like everything. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I think there's a lot of people who over the years have be, become more and more moved by by what he by what he can paint and 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 and, uh, and present to you. Really, uh, what's so extraordinary about it is he, he would do it in 30 minutes. Um, and I also would say, if you think that it doesn't take much talent to do that, go try to paint alongside an episode. I did. And it was pathetic. Um, <laughs> if I, if I showed you a picture now, you would for sure be kicking me off of this or keep me on <laughs> to just laugh at me and ridicule me. Um, he, this man was so talented. He really, really was. Yeah. I mean, two people who really love Bob Ross are Melissa McCarthy and Ben Falcone, the producers of this film. And I love the backstory of how they came to want to make a documentary about the life of Bob Ross. Could you talk us through that? It's so interesting. Yeah. I'll, if it's OK with you, I'll, I'll give you their their sort of road to, <laughs> okay. to, to, to the doc and, and mine. And, and obviously it intersected. So on, on their end, they apparently, you know, they were huge fans uh, of Bob and both Ben and Melissa wanted to surprise each other with a Bob Ross painting as a birthday gift. And their birthdays are pretty close to each other. Actually, Ben's birthday is, is today when we're recording this. Um, and at one point, one of them won out and was somehow able to, 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 get, uh, to, to, to get the painting uh, and surprise the other. I think Ben was the the one who was able to get it. So um, they each spontaneously decided to surprise each other with this, with a Bob and, Ross painting. And they both reached out to their, their manager who they have this, obviously they have the same manager. And so, so this guy is getting calls from both of them saying, Hey, I need you to help me find a Bob Ross painting to surprise <laughs> the other. Um, so they, they were, they were huge Bob Ross fans. Um, and they had given some thought to maybe making a scripted film uh, about, about Bob. And but when they when they went online to just do that sort of cursory, you know, Google search that we all do now when we want to find out about something initially, there just wasn't much information online and definitely not enough to inform a, a screenplay about somebody's life. Back up with me for a second. I've been thinking about maybe making a doc about various American artists through different periods in history, uh, modern history that were sort of, you know, ridden with uh, with a lot of strife and challenges. And Bob Ross was on my list for the 80s. And I and obviously the 80s was a fascinating time. But that was just, I did a little bit of outreach, but not much. And it wasn't totally something I was even thinking a lot about. My producing partner, Steven Berger, and I, we had a meeting set up with uh, Ben and Melissa's production company. So we met with their executive first. Her name's Divya D'Souza. And, and it was during this meeting that she mentioned that they love Bob, wanted to make the, the scripted movie couldn't find anything out and i just said well what if what if we made a doc uh and we that we could find out everything and then we sat with ben and melissa and we all just kind of vibed and just really just spoke about bob this there was nothing showbiz ish about the meeting all we were doing was talking about how much we love bob ross and what's interesting is that we knew next to nothing about him but yet the conversation kept going and we were all compelled to keep to keep talking about him. Um, and so we walked away from that thinking, OK, let, let's try to do let's try to do this, um, not knowing what this is. And then when 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 we went and, and set about doing what is really step one for us, which is trying to 
you know, if you're making a doc about a, a person who's alive, you try to reach out to them, of course. Bob died in 95. So, you know, what you do is you reach out to the people who knew him, who were related to him, who, who worked with him. And we were coming up against uh, something that really surprised me. And it was that, number one, everybody said, you know, that they loved him and they missed him. These people who were friends with him and who had worked with him. But but the thing that kept coming up that that was so compelling was that they were all afraid to talk about Bob publicly uh, out of fear of some sort of legal retribution. And there was an there was a corporate entity that was sort of at the heart of this uh, this fear uh, that they didn't want to name. And it, it was in that moment that I that I knew for sure we we were going to pursue this. Yeah. Wow. Have you um, had any blowback from the Kowalskis, Bob Ross's business partners? Have you heard from them? I, they, they, I mean, we, we've we've heard we've heard from them. We we included, you know, in the in the sort of coda of the film in the title cards, what the response was to some of the things we put forward. They had every opportunity to speak. They chose not to. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, their representative at a certain point even made it clear that they they don't speak to anybody else anyway. (laughs) So they're, you know, they like, they want to complain about not getting an opportunity. Um, but yet they wouldn't speak, uh, even if they had it because they do their own thing as it relates to these, they are free to say whatever they want. I think they put out some sort of statement today. Uh, it was full of factual inaccuracies actually. Um, and, uh, it just, it is what it is. We've told Bob's story and I'm incredibly uh, comfortable with what we've put out into the public sphere. Yeah. Have you heard from, um, Steve Ross, his son? Yeah. So Steve, uh, Steve, Steve, we, you know, Steve, of course, got a chance to see the movie before everybody else did. And his response was amazing. I, I think tears of gratitude and joy was, was the exact quote. Um, he was, he was really pleased with it. So that was in, in many ways, that's, that's, what's most important to us. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating because he is such a talented artist in his own right, and I never even knew about him because he had never spoken to anybody before about his dad. So this was it was really illuminating to see him and and hear his story. Yeah, Steve is. Uh, I think he's just so so moving in this film. Um, you know, you, we could talk about the the sort of. Uh, the business and legal fallout uh, all day long. But really what this movie is about, you know, far more than that, I think is, is this, this boy, this young man in his twenties who, who, who lost his father to cancer. And, you know, Bob was only 52 when he died and Steve was robbed of, of what could have been, you know, decades of, of of life, you know, with that relationship continuing. And so I think that, um, I think that Steve's love for his father and how deeply he misses his father and still feels the magnitude of that loss is probably what shines through more than anything. Um, well, what do you want? Uh, like, what do you think the big takeaway here is? Do you want people to explore more about, uh, Bob Ross's art or, you know, understand his legacy better? I really, more than anything, I just want, I want people to feel an emotional connection to Bob in a way that they obviously could have never had the opportunity to do so. Um, He's incredible in his 30 minutes on his show. Obviously that's what made him an icon. Um, Sure, the memes with Bob Ross are are often hilarious and 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 often very sweet, you know, as well. But he's he's more than what went on in the thirty minutes in the show, and he's he's so much more than a meme for sure. Um, and so I, I I hope that people could uh, just get a sense of of what the trajectory and the arc of his life uh, was really like, and then and then feel feel more emotionally connected to him. And I, like I said at the beginning, I, I think people will just love him even more. Yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Josh, for uh, coming on Nope and talking about your your film and congratulations, um, everyone. It's uh, on Netflix now, so uh, watch it. It's great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.
All right. Great interview. I cannot wait to watch uh, the documentary. I have plenty to watch this weekend now. And uh, it's time for the ups. These are the little rays of light, the little beacons of hope that got us through the week. Uh, Rachel, why don't you start? Yeah, my yup this week goes to Larry David, who I love. And there was a story in page six about how Alan Dershowitz bumped into Larry on the porch of a convenience store in Martha's Vineyard. And Dershowitz was like, we can still talk, Larry. And Larry just started screaming. <laughs> He's like, no, no, we can't. I saw you. I saw you with your arm around Pompeo. It's disgusting. And Dershowitz was like, he's my former student at Harvard Law. I greet all my former students that way. I can't greet my former students. And Larry David was like, it's disgusting. Your whole enclave is disgusting. You're disgusting. And then we'll what did what did Alan Dershowitz do? He strips. He takes what? his shirt off. Yes. And so he was wearing one t-shirt on top of another t-shirt. And the t-shirt underneath said, it's the constitution, stupid. So he takes off his shirt and like shows it in Larry's face. And, and he drove off in an old dirty Volvo. So, <laughs> Wait, I, 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 I picture this thing where Alan Dershowitz just keeps taking off shirts where it's like preamble to the constitution, article one, article two. Yes. <laughs> Yes, that's what he does. He hangs out on the porch of a convenience store <laughs> in 30, with 30 t-shirts layered on top of each other, hoping Deliver that Larry David message. will walk up to him. Okay. My up goes to Airbnb. Uh, oh. And in addition to the fact that I've had some good Airbnb uh, experiences recently, they announced that they are taking in to their host houses 20,000 Afghan refugees. They are placing them voluntarily with different Airbnb hosts. They are paying the Airbnb hosts as if they were regular guests staying there and um, and providing a place for the Afghan refugees to live. So That's a really um, nice way for a company to do what they do to make the world yeah better. and i mean what i like it's not just another like whitewashing thing you know they don't make a statement that they're in favor of diversity or you know protest you know they're police doing violence something, or something. Yeah. they're actually putting their money where their mouth is it's probably expensive for them to lay out all this cash to the yeah. airbnb host so brian chesky and uh airbnb up to you uh yep we need to you. good we work we so rarely give companies a yup you never. know i like... can't remember ever doing that so <laughs> there you go airbnb yeah. okay thanks uh thanks for tuning in this week we hope you enjoyed the show and our interview and uh we had a great time it was a terrible terrible week but we really enjoyed making this podcast if you've enjoyed it too please rate review subscribe tell a friend in real life that's the best way email to get us. the word out email us about <laughs> anything that happens in your <laughs> corporate meetings <Work>. your <laughs> expansion marketing strategy meetings okay uh what did I, I already said this thanks for listening uh this is nope the podcast where we shut it down 